Hi everyone, welcome to the HIPAC 2019 software webinar. My name is Brittany Hines, Marketing Specialist here at HIPAC, and I will be your host for today's presentation. Before we begin, I just want to remind you about the question box on the side of your screen. We will be taking questions at the end of the webinar, so please submit them there and we will try to answer as much as we can. Also, if you are unable to hear us or the screen goes blank, please comment in the chat box so we can fix the issue. For today's webinar, we are going to show you some of the new features in our HIPAC 2019 software. We are also very excited to have our guest speaker on the call, Mr. Chris Wright from CR Environmental. I would now like to introduce to you our presenter for today, Rob Baird, who is now in his ninth year in tech support at HiPAC, having traveled the world to perform HiPAC, HiSweep, and DredgePack integrations and trainings. He brings extraordinary experience and expertise to our company, and we are so happy to have him here today to talk with us more about our new version of our software. With that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Mr. Rob Baird. Thank you so much, Brittany. So we're all very excited about the upcoming release of HiPAC 2019. And just like every other year, here we are with the new software. We're excited to go through some of the new advancements in that software. We're going to go through just a few of them today. We're going to focus on, I would say, the most important improvements to the HiPAC 2019 software. We're not going to be able to show everything today. That would take a much longer webinar in the 45 minutes that we have. We're going to talk about some of the most impactful changes that we've seen from 2018 to 2019. After that, we're going to try our best to offer up some new examples of unconventional uses of HiPAC. And for that, we're going to rely heavily on Mr. Chris Wright from CR Environmental in Massachusetts. And we have some very cool pictures to show you from some of Chris's work throughout the years. And then after that, we'd like to answer any submitted HiPAC user questions. We've received some in advance via email, and uh, you can also contact us throughout this webinar, and Brittany will be here to read your questions and filter them through to me. First and foremost, this is perhaps the most exciting to me of all of the digital milestones in HiPAC 2019, and that is the HiPAC Instant Profile. People have been asking for this for years. Here we are able to deliver it nicely in HiPAC 2019. What we're going to do is zoom in on an area where we think there might be some nice variable bottom features. And once we're there, we're going to select this tool and we are going to cut a slice, if you will, through our data. And in doing so, it pops open this instant profile window. We can now take a look at the seafloor without having to go into any editor, do any post-processing. If we hit this button here, it will zoom extends, and there you can see it's auto-scaled, and it will show you the distance down the line and depth at the cursor, unless you go here to where it says cursor and you snap to the line. Now it will move as we go down the line, and it will locate the exact distance and also the depth of the bottom at that spot. So a uh, very exciting thing. You could choose to zoom in, zoom out, but this is great because a lot of times people want to be able to see something nice down and dirty really quick and you don't want to have to worry about going into any editing and doing any of that stuff to try to produce a nice looking uh, picture. So instead of having to get through to final products here, you can just do this in the shell, quickly slice across your matrix data. You do need a matrix file, so this is very good for high sweep surveys or even dredge work. Uh, if you have a dredge matrix, you can do the same here. We also have a new border area report and filled border files, so this is slightly changed. And again, it's you, the user, that fuels these changes in high pack. It's such a commonsensical request and here we have implemented the ability to show the perimeter distance and area of any border file so it's at the bottom of the new border area report in addition to that sometimes users like to have multiple border files shown in the high pack shell and it's very difficult perhaps to see from one border to the next so you can have now a, a filled border area in 3d mode and that is shown on the right side not all of these new improvements in HiPAC are anything that you're going to uh, go in and uh, perhaps manipulate yourself in the HiPAC shell or, or anywhere else. But for this next 
So on the BSB and RNC charts, we're just showing greater visualizations than ever before. So you're able to see a higher accuracy projection of any of these charts that you're going to show in the high pack shell. And as you can see in the control panel, under the raster options, there is, there is now the ability to hide the border. And that's important because sometimes if you have these RNC charts, these raster displays can show multiple borders and they can be juxtaposed on each other, one on top of the next. And it really doesn't make it easy for you to see a nice a smooth type of map. So if you hide the border, you can have multiple raster charts and they'll flow nicer uh, from one to the next. We have also done a lot of work to improve the web map server. And what's great about it now, we've added more servers to be um, implemented by high pack users. To me, the most exciting one is that you can now go out and get a live weather map. So you have your project set up, you have all your channel files, you have your line files, you know exactly where you're going to go. You're just not there yet, but perhaps you'll be there tomorrow or you'll be there later on this afternoon. Uh, and you, you just want to be able to see what you're going to be up against. And now you can go out and download these weather maps and have them overlaid in high pack with the rest of your project file. So it's a very useful tool. Imagine if you're going offshore or if you're just going out anywhere, we're, you know, we're on water all the time, right? So it's a very uh, useful thing for us to be able to add that. We have some KMZ updates. This will be very helpful because I know some people like to take the image geo reference editor in high pack and then you take a Google Earth image, maybe a PNG or JPEG, you bring it into the image geo reference editor and you use it as a background chart. And you've probably noticed that the resolution can get grainy as you log in or as you zoom into it rather. So in, in this case, what we've done is two things. One, we've improved the exporting out to Google Earth because Google Earth itself is such a powerful tool. But we've also now put the ability to import a Google Earth KMZ file directly into the HiPack shell. You can see here at the left side in the project directory, the KMZ file is loaded, just like any other background chart could be loaded, DXFs, et cetera. So we're taking Google Earth KMZs directly into HiPack now something we've never been able to do before. Here is another very useful tool, especially in the age of LiDAR. We have so many people out there that are moving to drones and the use of LiDAR technologies to cover enormous areas and try to be able to cover survey data sets that, or survey areas and get data sets that they never would have been able to cover in a short period of time before. Uh, what I think of mostly is uh, in some of these areas where you have enormous sand or salt or potash types of deposits and perhaps they're being added to daily. Uh, maybe you're at some sort of factory and there's a slurry of salt or sand or whatever being brought in at all times and as it ends up there, um, we need to be able to go and see what the daily or weekly changes are to that stockpile. So now it's a new option in the TIN model where you can actually create a border file you can do multiple stockpiles at one time. And what you can do is measure these out and be able to get your volume calculation for that stockpile over time. So you can do it today, the next week, et cetera, limited to the border area. And this is going to be great, especially, like I said, with so many more survey companies going to LIDAR. Here's another visualization that we've seen that has been greatly improved in high pack 2019 and this is all because of improved downsampling. If you look at the left we have an image in Sonar Pro and when you have a proprietary software you would imagine that you're going to be able to show that particular manufacturer's sonar display in great detail and as the manufacturer would like it to be seen and that's the case. Well in the middle picture you see a side scan survey image and this is with the same sonar that use, is used at the left. So we have a Klein. And uh, the 2018 image is a little bit grainy and perhaps too bright in some areas. But if you look at the image on the right, side scan survey in 2019, it's a lot more closely related to the picture at left, the Sonar Pro. So we're doing a better job now to show the, the side scan real-time mosaicing um, and it looks a lot more like the proprietary software. 
we have also been able to add a bunch of advancements in the targeting and mosaicing area as well. What we've added into it is the use of dual frequency side scan sonars. We can display them obviously simultaneously, but the best part about it is if you mark a target at the left side and then you choose to go and toggle over to the the other frequency, you will see the same target represented uh, on the right side as well. So you can show multiple frequencies, you can do your targeting and mosaicing, and the co-located cursor is going to be able to show you what you've done in one frequency in the same location for the other frequency. So it's nice to easily toggle back and forth between your multiple frequency data. And now we go to the high scan target editor. I know in the past uh, we've had people call into tech support and they say, you know, I, I just want to be able to change the color of my target. People will prepare long documents, presentations that they want to show. And sometimes it's all about what your end user would like to see in the final product. Maybe they want to see the, the gold scale or rust or whatever it might be. And that changes. Not everyone wants to see their targets the same way and so in the past it was hard if you marked the target and then you wanted to change the color you were out of luck you had to reload the data or at least go back and retarget and then change it to your uh, optimal color but now you can go back and forth change your color options after you mark your target to also change the frequencies uh, so just like in the real time uh, di display here in the target editor you're going to be able to go back and forth between frequencies and now also colors to show what you'd like. This is another great option, the auto TVG smoothing. So in the past, when we did our time varied gain smoothing options, it was all reliant on using every single sample. And of course, when you use every sample, you can see the picture at the top, you're going to get some jagged edges. You're going to see some data points that perhaps shouldn't be there. And of course, they can affect any type of averaging that we're going to be doing. So now there is a slider bar that the user can affect a change with, and it controls the number of samples that will be used for the time varied gain smoothing curve. So it's a great new option here in HiPack 2019 to be able to do that, and uh, it can really make your data look that much cleaner, and the smooth, uh, the smooth curve is evident. We also now in uh, mosaicing, we can show multi-frequency data. If you look at the picture at the bottom on left, we have one frequency and at the right, another. Well, to the right side, we have a representation of these two frequencies and one is shown in red, the other in blue, and where they intersect uh, is green. And you can see based on this where you have better, better coverage for which frequency, but it's a nice way to show what exactly you have, what imagery is shown, and um, it's a nice way to be able to imagine what both frequencies are doing for you. This is nice here, how in auto mosaicing, we can now select the frequency that we would like to show. In the past, if you had multiple frequencies, we would only show the first one that was available. And when you do that, when you show the first one available, if it happens to be a low frequency, well, it might not be optimal. You probably prefer to have a higher frequency chosen for your auto mosaic. So now you can go back and forth. And again, the ability to change your frequencies and your view options as the user is, is very important to us in HIPEC 2019. Another very exciting avenue for us to explore, and that is the R2 Sonic Sonar has now started to record multiple frequencies simultaneously. So in this example, we show frequencies of 100, 200, and 400 kilohertz at left, all three enabled, and you can see their colors represented in red, green, and blue. They show the various frequencies. You can choose, as is shown in the cloud pop-up window at the right, to choose just the one frequency, in this case, the high frequency data. But again, just like in the side scan sonar advancements, what you're gonna see here is whatever you show in the one side, you can do editing on the other and it will allow you to edit across frequencies. We have also now done great work to improve the beam angle test. Now this test has been important 
to surveyors for many years the ability to take your own multi-beam sonar and see how it's performing up against various uh, various means or various ways of measuring uh, its efficiency and its confidence level. So what we want to show is a 95% confidence level, and you can choose which standard you want. And now in the new updated beam angle test, there's additional stats and a graph update. But most importantly, it's what we see at the bottom here, that we are now working with tilted head and dual head systems. I believe that's a great advancement for our multi-beam users. And the grid convergence in high sweep. This really affects surveyors and dredgers alike. The farther north you go, the greater grid convergence that is evident. And in this case now, we no longer have to worry about it as it is automatically taken care of the calibration now done in high sweep. So we don't have to worry about the offset between grid north and geodetic north. We also now can get NOAA tide station data online. This is very important for us because in the past you had to be within a reach of a, of a beacon and be able to uh, get that transmission. But now the ability to take NOAA tide station data and read it online is, is a great advancement in HIPAC 2019. I believe that the vast majority of users now are trying to have internet on them in some way, shape, or form, even if it's just a hotspot on their smartphone as they go out there. It's so useful for us to be able to log into computers. And another great thing, um, another great side effect, if you will, of having internet on your boat is, is this. Now, you're able to get your NOAA tide station data in a new way, and uh, I think it's going to free up a, a lot of options. And um, I, I'm excited to see how people use this to try to uh, perhaps at least limit the cost uh, in the short term of their surveys. Now we're into my world, the 3D dredging world. I do more dredging integrations probably than anything these days. Um, also, a lot of high pack survey and high sweep uh, survey users out there can look at this and say, hey, wait a second, that looks familiar. Yeah, that, that real-time cloud window that's used so often in multi-beam surveys, it's now really looking good for dredgers as well. If you have any type of presentation you'd like to give or if you have somebody sitting at a desk somewhere that doesn't understand dredging the way you do and you need them to be able to see how the operation is running from afar, you can now show this off and the real-time cloud window gives us the ability to show that that three-dimensional boat and of course the sea floor beneath it so um, great thing for us to be able to now have improved 3d dredging all right now that's going to bring us to an exciting part in our talk today we're going to bring in mr chris wright from cr environmental in massachusetts He's been working with HIPAC since 1996. He's one of the coolest guys to ever talk to, and he's called in through the years many times over. Welcome, Chris. Hi, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, we got you loud and clear. Okay, great. So, all right, first off, I'm excited to talk about how you use HIPAC because I know through the years we've talked so many times, and you come up with some of the wildest and coolest use cases out there and today we're going to look at a few and the first slide we have with a classified single beam sonar transects at left maybe you could just give us a little uh, background on how you started this survey and what purpose it serves okay so uh, I work with an environmental consulting company and uh, one of the, the real challenges that we have is trying to implement remote sensing to speed up mapping of sensitive environmental resources. In, in this case, we're talking eelgrass. Um, so uh, a typical survey is done using divers that swim down, they measure quadrats, somebody up, up top is tracking their position and taking notes. Uh, we feel that it's a, a lot easier, if you can, to go ahead and use either single beam or multi-beam to detect this and map this eel, these eelgrass stands uh, remotely. So what you're looking at there on the left uh, is a, a single beam survey that was conducted over a patch of eelgrass. Uh, I've gone through and classified the echogram that we'll see on a separate slide for the presence or absence of eelgrass. 
So those are the actual track lines. They're probably spaced on, on that average five feet apart. Uh, so where you see the green, there's yellow grass. Where you see the blue, there's none. Simple point files. XYZ exports from the single beam editor. Uh, of course, there's some ground truthing that's required for this. What we do is we use a towed underwater video sled and track its position using a high pack driver. Uh, so instead of on the right, instead of just looking at the individual sounding points that have been classified for presence or absence, what you can do is then instead uh, export the sounding range within some interval. Let's say it's three feet across track or along track, excuse me, uh, and plot that up, create a grid that is really representing the acoustic interference range. Uh, and you can see that there's a very strong agreement. I know it's a small image, but a very strong agreement between a, our video ground truthing data and the, uh, the acoustic ob observations. Wow, Chris, that's, that is really exciting here as we look at this. You're right. It is a, a brilliant way to use HIPAC for cross-referencing. And in this case, I have to admit, I have never in eight and a half years here at HIPAC heard of anybody else doing something similar. And so, uh, once again, Chris, I got to hand it to you. I love how you're using HIPAC. And, and again, this is just... Um, we have high pack on a boat. You have a, a towed device. In this case, the video sled. You're providing GPS and and able to cross reference it, take it out to another software, and and, and get all these other exports. Good stuff. Thanks. Let's move on now. Here we go to the echogram window that you were talking about before. This shown in the high pack SB Max 64 echogram profile window and. As we drive the line from left to right, maybe you could take us through this slide and, and bring us into your thinking as you try to identify what is on the bottom. Okay, so uh, for folks that are using uh, single beam systems that provide the echogram, in the single beam editor, you, you're probably familiar with uh, having several windows open. One would be the echogram that we're looking at, and the other might just be the simple sounding trace, and another window might be the survey window. So what, uh, what I do is I zoom in on the echogram very carefully, uh, and uh, in this case, uh, for the previous slides, I would delete everything where the, uh, there was no eelgrass present and save that file separately. Uh, it's pretty clear, uh, if you had a, a good look at this, where you know, the difference between the rocks, the eelgrass where you can still see the, uh, the seabed beneath them. Uh, Technically, I, sh I shouldn't be calling this eelgrass right on, on an echogram, right? It's just aquatic vegetation. But having that video ground truthing, uh, you know, we can, we can take it to the next level. Yeah, very, very cool stuff again, Chris. And it does allow the user a greater confidence when going through an area and that cross-referencing, the ground truthing that you described is, is quite important as we go about our surveys. All right. So... Our next slide, now we're into the multi-beam world that you also talked about, and we can see any number of points shown here in this MB Max 64 profile window. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about, again, how you're looking at this. Now, this is not a left-to-right representation as the single-beam slide was. Instead, we're sort of driving over this, right? So maybe you could tell us um, a little bit about this. Well, uh, it's another real grass survey in another location, and rather than using single beam, this job required the use of multi-beam. Uh, it does a lot better job of mapping eel grass or aquatic vegetation than the single beam does. But as I'm, I'm sure you're all aware, it increases the survey costs pretty significantly. The users are required to have a, a lot more training to be able to do it. So the profile that we're looking at, uh, you can see where there's bare seafloor. There's uh, each each line or each uh, swath has a different color. So line one through 10, let's say. The green one happens to be a, a cross line that I drew across. Uh, so where there's bare seabed, you can see the strong agreement between soundings. And then uh, sure enough, as soon as you get into that acoustic interference from the, the aquatic vegetation, it's, you see all the spikiness. There's a, a lot of even <clears throat> strong agreement in the uh, eelgrass itself, despite the, the tides and currents, which is kind of surprising. And I've looked at this type of profile so many times here in tech support, but 
one thing I could tell you is usually the question from the user would be, oh, look at all this noise or look at all this stuff above the hard bottom. Can you just help me get rid of it? I just need to know how to get past all this stuff. And uh, I find it fascinating that you're trying to find new ways to show us what is actually there, including all of that vegetation, in this case, the eelgrass. So kudos once again. Thanks. Okay. And now as we push along, we look deeper into your eelgrass monitoring surveys. Maybe you can walk us through this as we take a look at two different views, completely uh, different ways of looking at the data, but both derived from your multi-beam system. Yeah, sure. Um, so multi-beam systems nowadays, uh, depending on how you've uh, purchased them and what options you've selected are capable of not just recording the depths, but they're capable of recording backscatter and side scan as well. So a simple uh, relief map created from uh, the minimum soundings, for instance, uh, is shown on the left, and it's pretty clear where the, the eelgrass is, is shown. This is the same data set that we looked at on the previous slide. You could look at, uh, look at it instead of minimum soundings. You could look at the sounding range. That's a, another XYZ export option from HIPAC, or you could look at the cell standard deviations. They're all going to show you basically the same thing, the extent of the eelgrass. Uh, in this case, you can actually, if, you, if we were looking at a larger image, you could just look down and see you know, individual square foot stands or patches of the eelgrass. On the right, where you're seeing, that's the acoustic backscatter uh, that's been run through HIPAC using their version of GeoCoder. Uh, and exported back out as an XYDB file and used to model the presence and absence of eelgrass. And uh, so you can see just generally uh, where there's a smooth seabed, the lighter gray areas, and where there's a, the stands of eelgrass where it's, uh, the reflectivity is much higher, the darker areas. Yeah, that is that is fascinating stuff to be able to alternately look at what you see top looking down or how you can classify it further based on texture and uh, it, it's just uh, good stuff yet again. We're oh, going thanks. to go oh, now. Sorry, Chris. Sorry, We're going to go deeper into that awesome. backscatter yeah, uh, comparison if you could. Yeah, sure. Uh, so not always looking for dust deal grass, but maybe we're looking for uh, impacts to the benthic community, so changes in sediment texture before and after a particular type of project. In this case, we're looking at a, a plowing, a hydroplow project, and the concern was that a lot of silt would be draped over what might be sensitive benthic habitat. So if you, we ran a multi-beam surveys uh, before the plowing operation and then after, processed the backscatter from each one of them, normalized them using a reference area, and we were able to quantitatively compare them to determine or to begin to determine whether or not there had been uh, significant siltation with the aid of ground truthing, of course, sampling, spy cameras, you name it. And again, I, I, I take it that you spend a great amount of your time not just going in, and we've talked about this in the past, it's not enough to just take a multi-beam uh, data set home with you after you go out into the field and you spend however much time and energy and money, of course, mobilizing for the survey, it's just not enough to come home and say, I have the discrete bottom, I have my XYZ file, I know what it looks like from above, this is how deep the water is, anything else. So I, I like how you're not only showing the multiple ways of, of, uh, of getting to the, the truth um, at the bottom, in this case, the texture analysis with backscatter data, but um, it, it is great also that you're you're taking multiple data sets uh, home with you. And I think you, you mentioned it earlier, uh, something about reusing your data set. How, what was that again? What's your mantra? Oh, it's, it's, it's not mine, but uh, in the <laughs> hydrographic literature, uh, you always hear people saying, well, survey once and use as many times as possible, multiple times. For us as environmental consultants, when we're trying to answer a particular type of problem, it's multiple lines of evidence that we really need. So with one multi-beam survey, I'm getting not just the bathymetry, but I'm getting the acoustic interference range. Uh, I'm getting the backscatter. I'm getting the side scan sonar signal that we haven't looked at, but they're usually pretty darn sharp. So one survey, four lines of evidence, maybe five just from a single pass. Oh, folks, to be a fly on the wall.
Um, now what we're going to do, Chris, is we have some time to take some questions from some users uh, that have emailed in or uh, chatted with us here throughout the course of this. And we will now talk to Brittany Danik Hines for that. So now there were a lot of questions that came in. So we're going to go ahead and start the Q&A section of the webinar. We do hope that you stick around for this section. But if you're unable to, we want to thank you for joining us today. And we hope to connect with you in the near future about HIPAC 2019. Now we're going to try to answer all the questions, but if yours does go unanswered, we will follow up with you via email over the next couple of days. All right. Thank you, Brittany. From Michelle in New Brunswick, Canada, are there any new features in HIPAC 2019 that can be used by potential clients that may not have a HIPAC key? Okay. I see. See, that's a good one because we often have people saying, you know what, I have a potential client that wants to see something from me. They want to see something very quickly and easily. And so I'm thinking about back to this. And again, just to show you one more time, it is the instant profile tool. You do need a matrix file. So if you have a high sweep survey uh, or if you have a single beam survey that has been interpolated in between in TID model or something else, uh, or if you have a dredge matrix survey, those are probably the, the best use cases for this high sweep and dredge pack matrix files. And then you just select that tool, instant profile, you cut across. And again, this is great because you know what? You can work this even if you do not have a key. So if you have someone that can download HiPack and they install it on their computer, you can send them the matrix file, they can load it into the HiPack shell, even without a software key, and then they can navigate through and see all these different options and say, okay, wow, as I go down this transect line, you know what, the depth is going to be such. And so uh, to me, I think that's just a, a very great tool that somebody that doesn't have high pack can see and they might say, you know what, we really do need that work done um, as expected. And, you know, it's, it's nice that you can do this now. All right. The next question coming in. All right. We have an anonymous question. Could it be developed for IOC tide gauges? Okay. So I'm assuming we're talking about the, uh, the importing of the NOAA tides. So the NOAA tides interface. Well, it certainly could eventually be developed for IOC tide gauges. As, as of right now, what we're looking at is um, just using uh, the NOAA tide station data. And as it always happens in HIPAC, we're going to have advancements and changes as we go on from one version to the next. And usually is the case when you see one man agency that is looking to implement some new changes. Once it gets into the software once, <laughs> we see it happen time and time again. So although we uh, cannot currently do that, um, it, it's a great idea and uh, it is something that we will, I'm sure, consider going forward. Okay, what's this? Okay, Mike in Jupiter Beach, Florida. Can we use the tin stockpile volumes for beach replenishment projects as well? Yes, that is a great question. Probably should have focused on that a little bit more earlier, but with the tin stockpile volumes, you just need to create yourself a border file and then you can go back to the well time and time again. So yes, it can be done. Now, of course, if you're talking about anything that would be underwater now, it's not so easy to just do the LIDAR portion. But if you're looking at replenishing the beach and you want to talk about all of the areas above water, that is very easy. You could also combine data sets, of course, if you wanted to uh, include that which is under the water. But of course, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to use this very same tool for beach replenishment surveys. In fact, we see it all the time now where users are flying a drone up and down a beach, you can cover a half mile or a mile or whatever it might be in such short time. And in the past, um, we've required however many surveyors to walk that beach with survey rods and their GPS attached. And now it is just so quick and easy for us to be able to fly over. And with the tin stock pile volumes, we can easily kick out volumes for the same bordered area time and time again. So it's really meant for that purpose. Okay, the next question. We are going to um, ask 
another question of our Chris Wright. So the question uh, has been asked, what is the coolest use case of HiPack in all of your years of working with the software? And, and Chris, you brought us through some really cool ones uh, in the last few minutes here. Perhaps you can now tell us what, what was your favorite survey or what was the coolest use case you've ever implemented in your 23 years used in HiPack? Okay, great. Uh, well, uh, right off the top of my head, it, it wasn't a paying job. I, I used to live on a, a lake that was stocked with trout, um, and I wanted to try to find out what the best fishing spots might be in the, in the hot summer months. So just uh, with a small laptop, a GPS, and a YSI sound, uh, I used the HiPack generic DLL, I think it's called. It's a, it's a user programmable DLL so that I could drag this YSI water quality meter along the bottom uh, in a little sled that we had built for it and simultaneously record the bottom temperature and conductivity, et cetera, with the high pack position and time timestamps. So I was able to, you know, that night, just sitting around the house, come up with a, uh, a contour map that showed exactly where the groundwater discharge zones were. And sure enough, when I went fishing at these particular locations in the heat of the summer, that's where the cool water was near the bottom. And uh, I, I caught a lot of trout. <laughs> Only you, Chris. That's great. So <laughs> I have to actually figure out how to do that myself. And uh, the next time I want to go out and, and do some fishing, maybe you're the guy I should be calling, huh? I'll, I'll, I'll tag along. <laughs> Oh, that's good stuff. All right, so uh, yeah, and and you you mentioned configurable drivers and all the rest. I was I was uh, very impressed at not so long ago talking to your young associate Ben up there at CR Environmental, and he was able to, to uh, take the I believe it was the NEMA driver and uh, or one of the configurable drivers, and he was able to bring in pitch and roll through a GPS. And uh, I got to admit it. Was, it was the first time I had seen anyone bring in pitch and roll through that GPS. So uh, apparently you are taking your ingenuity and passing it on to the next generation. Ben's a pretty sharp guy. We're, we're lucky to have him. Yeah. Yeah, that's good stuff. All right, let's see if we could take a couple more questions here. What's this? Let's see. We're talking about large matrix files. How would you deal with large matrix files over weeks, weeks of multi-beam survey? Okay, well, if you're using, and to define large matrix files, there's any ways, that, any number of ways where you can take your data sets and, and uh, either store them externally. We would always suggest you back up everything externally, obviously, but uh, what would you do? Um, well, I would say for the most part, I would have one processing um, project. I would not leave those uh, huge matrix files for too long in my survey project. And um, Chris, you might have another idea with that, but that's just the way I've looked at it. If, if ever there are uh, too many files in one project, you know, obviously we could have issues when we open up survey with uh, allocating enough memory. Um, do you have any idea? What, how, how do you deal with your file storage issues? Uh, well, if I look at the matrix files, uh, in two ways. So obviously you're trying to keep track of your coverage in the field. And in, in my mind, there's no need to have uh, an overly high resolution. Uh, so your field matrix, I you know, call it a 10 by 10 foot or 10 by 10 meter, whatever it is, you're just trying to get an idea of uh, where you've been. Then your processing matrix, uh, there really is no limitation like that. I've, I've loaded up 20 or 30 days worth of multi-beam files into a single, call it three by three foot matrix. and never had a problem. All right, everyone. Unfortunately, we are out of time, so we're going to wrap this up. But we would like to thank you for your participation and hope you enjoyed the webinar today. Thank you, Rob and Chris. That was a great presentation. Uh, we're so excited about this new version of our software and hope it gave everyone a better understanding of how HiPack 2019 works and how it can better help your projects.